I'm going to introduce our moderator today, Ricky Volante. He put a lot of work into this program. We have a great presentation for you today. Ricky is an attorney with the Volante Law Firm. His practice primarily focuses on legal issues related to professional and amateur sports, film, television, and media, IP, and corporate law. Ricky serves as outside counsel, outside legal counsel to Ohio's first launch Type C sports gaming proprietor. He also currently teaches the courses Legal Issues in Sport and the Professional Sports Industry at Baldwin Wallace University. Ricky, thank you so much for the work you put in today. We really appreciate it. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me and giving me that uh, brief introduction, Dominica, and thanks to the CMBA for having us today. I think we've got a, a really interesting and exciting group to, to discuss sports betting in Ohio and its initial rollout. Um, but just real quick before we get started, I did want to give uh, the responsible gambling message here. So uh, if you or anybody you know is suffering from an addiction or otherwise uh, issues with sports gambling or gambling in general, uh, you can go to the Ohio Problem Gambling Hotline, which is 1-800-589-9966. You can also go to the Casino Controls website, uh, casinocontrol.ohio.gov slash responsible gambling, or check out the Play Responsibly initiative at ohiolottery.com slash resources slash play dash responsibly, or you can check out their joint partnership at timeoutohio.com uh, for additional responsible gambling resources. <laughs> so with that, I want to introduce our panel today, uh, just starting in the order that they are on my screen, we have Jonathan Dillinger, uh, who is uh, runs the he is the sports gaming operations manager at the Ohio Lottery Commission. He is our one non lawyer joining us today. Uh, we have Carrie Barrett, who is the assistant general counsel for the Cleveland Cavaliers, and Andromeda Morrison, who is general counsel and director of skill games at the Ohio Casino Control Commission. So I appreciate y'all joining me today. Um, and with that, we're going to dive right in because we've got quite a bit to get through today. Uh, we're going to start with a general overview of the statues and rules that uh, regulate sports gaming in Ohio. And so I'm going to kick it over to Andromeda to first take us through just an overview of what the licensing process works and the types of licenses that the state of Ohio is issuing. Thanks, Ricky. And a pleasure to be here. And thank you to the CMBA uh, for having me. Um, so. Uh, House Bill uh, 29 uh, became effective January 1st, but obviously the commission has been working uh, through uh, the legislation as well as creating all of the administrative rules uh, for sports uh, gaming since uh, December 2021. Um, and as part of that, uh, the General Assembly has created a um, multi-tiered or multi-faceted aspect to sports gaming. Uh, we like to say that sports gaming, the sports gaming launch in Ohio uh, not only was it the largest um, expansion of, of gaming in Ohio history, but it is the largest simultaneous launch of sports gaming uh, in the country. And what I mean by that is that uh, starting January 1st, there were uh, basically three avenues available to Ohioans who wanted to participate in sports gaming through uh, three types of sports wagering uh, called type A, type A, type B, and type C. Um, Easy way to think about it is the type A uh, sports gaming, that's your online. So that's the, the mobile apps, the online apps that are available uh, for placing sports wagering. Type B, that's the physical brick and mortar style, Las Vegas style um, uh, sports uh, wagering facilities. And then type C uh, is the uh, sports gaming lottery, which uh, my colleague John uh, over at the lottery will get into two more. Um, and so each of these types um, starts with the licensing of what's called a proprietor. So a type A proprietor, type B proprietor, or type C proprietor. Um, these are uh, entities that were established by the General Assembly as being kind of the, uh, the, the foray into Ohio uh, for each of these uh, activities. So um, they are capped by the number of licenses that are available by the General Assembly. Uh, so there can be 25 um, type A proprietors, 40 type B, uh, and 20 type C. Um, and what the General Assembly has done as to the type A side is um, really these are businesses um, that have a physical presence in Ohio um, that have a significant economic impact on economic development in Ohio. And they provided preference to Ohio's existing 
uh, casinos and racinos, as well as professional sports teams that are here in Ohio. Um, and so uh, that basically uh, took us to 21 uh, preferred applicants for these uh, type A proprietor licenses uh, and for uh, kind of available to Ohio businesses that wanted to get to get into this. And so um, as those casinos or casino sports teams or other, uh, you know, businesses that have that significant economic impact wanted to get that proprietor license, they had the option of partnering with a mobile management services provider. Um, so this is another license type, which is really the sports book. Um, so, you know, if you have a sports team or a casino or a race, you know, and they were not uh, wanting to develop their own uh, sports book, uh, they could partner with an existing company, uh, you know, your Fandles, your DraftKings, your Caesars, uh, what have you, uh, to offer that online product on their behalf. And so it really is a partnership um, governed, uh, and I'm sure Carrie can talk, talk through maybe a little bit more on that, um, but a partnership, uh, a business relationship between that online sports book brand and uh, the, the Ohio um, applicant that holds that proprietor license. It's kind of similar, again, on the type B side. So that Las Vegas style uh, facility, uh, again, we're looking for businesses that have um, Ohio connections um, and uh, they can also, they can do it themselves or they can partner with what's called a management services provider. It's basically the same thing. It's a sports book brand that's coming in and providing um, the sports book uh, activity on behalf of that particular facility. Um, on the type B side, just a little note um, that the General Assembly further restricted um, the number of uh, type B, again, the, those physical Las Vegas style sports books uh, by county. Um, so some county, it's based on population. Uh, some counties uh, can are not eligible to have any physical sports book. Um, and then the maximum number uh, is five. Um, so Franklin County, Cuyahoga County, Hamilton County um, can have five, and then it, it kind of uh, wanes from there. So um, we do have a handy chart on our website if anyone's interested uh, to see where all of those can be, um, but just something to keep in mind if you do have uh, folks that are interested in having that type B establishment to check to see what licenses might be available uh, based upon those uh, number limits per county. Uh, and then that brings me to the type C side. Uh, the type C side is actually uh, uh, kind of in conjunction uh, with the Ohio Lottery. Um, the Casino Control Commission handles the licensing, uh, but John and his team uh, handle all of the rest of the implementation uh, and management of that program. So on the licensing front, there's two levels of licenses. One is the type C proprietor. Uh, so this is the entity that is licensed by the commission. They provide kiosks, um, have the ability to provide kiosks. They do the full uh, sports book, uh, um, so they they don't have the ability to partner with any of the other, uh, you know, management services providers or mobile management services providers. It's a one stop shop for them, uh, and then they can partner with um, local bars and taverns that have uh, certain liquor permits and are lottery retailers. Um, these are called Type C hosts, um, and those are also licensed by the commission to again be allowed to have uh, those kiosks in those locations. So. Um, and then John, John, of course, can talk through anything more. Our kind of, we do the licensing and then uh, hand everything over to the lottery as far as implement, implementation on that side. But it's complicated. Um, and so I would say there are resources available on the Casino Control website. Um, I'm trying to get a lot of information out really quickly, but there is a lot to digest as far as the structure of sports gaming. And so for any of you that are interested, please take advantage of the resources that are on our website. And to give Andromeda a moment to breathe here, we're we're going to kick it over to, to John for a moment now to take us through. So, okay, Type-C proprietors, Type-C hosts, as Andromeda said, the licensing process is handled by Ohio Casino Control, and then administratively and operationally, it works through the Ohio Lottery Commission from there. But before we jump into what that process looks like, um, I know that with the host, there is an element that lottery is involved with prior to getting licensed. So if you could take us through that and then take us through what that operational process looks like. Absolutely. Thank you, Ricky. And thank you to everyone for having me today. As Ramon had mentioned, it is very complex um, for the type C side of it. We do have a shared relationship with them. Uh, we do have a portion of the host process that does come through the lottery. So for those host locations that are eligible, 
Those would be the host locations, your bars, restaurants. They must be a lottery retailer. They must hold a D1, D2, or D5 liquor permit. Uh, they cannot be a nonprofit. And then they must be active in good standing with the lottery. So we up front uh, have set up a process with the lottery uh, starting in May. We have through our website what we call an interest form submission that these host locations can go through. They can request to be reviewed by the lottery uh, because the lottery is required to give a recommendation to casino control in order to have them issue the license. So we do kind of a pre vetting of them. We check their liquor permit. We check their uh, lottery status, make sure they're in good standing, make sure they're still active with the lottery. Uh, again, check their secretary of state, make sure they're a good business with the state of Ohio. Once they've done that, they get basically a pre-approval from us, a letter, and then from that point would go to casino control and apply for the formal license. So from our side of things, we have pre-approved over 1500 locations. I believe it's about 1575. And Andromeda can correct me, but I think casino control has licensed over about 1100 or so. Um, so that's kind of the current market that we're at right now. Once these host locations um, receive a formal license from casino control and have been recommended by us, it's then on their part to start to find a proprietor partner. So as we talked about, that would be your full service sports book. Those full service sports books for type C are required in the legislation to contract with the lottery. So we have currently seven that have been licensed by casino control, six of which have entered into contracts with the lottery. So those six are now available for the host locations to partner with. Uh, each one has a unique offering. Uh, there are different types of kiosks. There are different types of payment methods, different marketing and advertising that each one offers. So uh, part of what has been set up is an open market solution. So it allows for these proprietors within reason. We obviously have our regulations and our rules that they must follow, but allows for some uniqueness to offer differences that the host can kind of review and see, you know, maybe this location, I like the way their kiosks look this location, their, their footprint is smaller for me. I'm a smaller location, they would fit better. So they have to do their due diligence and find their partner. Once they find that partner, it's then a contract they enter in with the proprietor themselves. So that host proprietor contract would offer the terms of their agreement, what their compensation would be, you know, what type of equipment they can expect, what their responsibilities are as a host location, what the proprietor's responsibilities are. And then they're able to set up their own installation of kiosks. Uh, we do have some limitations with type C that are different than type A and B. Uh, there are limits initially to two kiosks per location or two, I should say, uh, terminals for each location that are selling sports gaming. Uh, it's not that it's a hard limit, but that's the initial request. Anything above two has to be a formal request to the lottery through casino control as well to request additional equipment, provide a justification why they feel that that's necessary, how it would fit in their location different parameters they would use to uh, regulate that. So there are some restrictions then, but once they find their partner, they get their kiosk, they're able to get them installed, and then they are able to sell in person off those kiosks or clerk operated terminals, sports gaming uh, in their location. So that's kind of the general overview. Like I said, we do have about a thousand or 1100, I should say, that have been fully licensed on both ends. Um, and that's kind of what our base is at the starting point here. And just to follow up with that, John, so the proprietors are going out to the hosts, contacting them, and then signing agreements with them, and then the proprietor is the one that is providing them with these uh, materials in terms of either terminals and or kiosks, so, but there is a market competitiveness amongst the proprietors to serve these hosts. Correct. It is uh, part of the way the legislation was written as an open market system having up to 20 proprietors, so uh, again, we've put in place through our operating standards and regulations and rules, different parameters that the proprietors must kind of fall within. But yes, it is an open market. They Once they are licensed and they've entered into a contract with us, uh, we then allow them to go out and start to um, find their host locations. And that is, is up to them. They, they are required to compensate the hosts in some form, whether that be a percentage of revenue, whether that be tangible um, you know, menus, anything that can be offered as far as compensation, but it is a requirement that they compensate the host in some form. They also are responsible for paying the cost of the kiosks and that upfront cost to install and set up the um, solution within these locations. So the host, their only out-of-pocket fee comes when they apply for the license. 
Uh, there is a one thousand uh, dollar fee at licensure that was put in place in the legislation as well. That's done when they apply with casino control. But outside of that, uh, the proprietor is responsible for the cost of the kiosks and getting them set up with a solution in their venue. John, you've led me right into our next topic, kicking it back over to Andromeda, the licensing fees. Um, so obviously this works a little bit differently based on the category and without getting into too much nuance and complexity here, because we could spend about the last 40 minutes doing just this. Um, what does that licensing fee structure look like based on the categories? Yeah, thanks, Ricky. Uh, the General Assembly has established a multi-tier, multi-year licensing uh, fee structure for nearly all of the license types. So again, these are set by statute. Um, John already mentioned uh, one of the easiest is the Type C host. It's $1,000 when you apply, um, and there's nothing uh, past that. Um, but when we start getting into uh, the uh, the type A and the type B pro providers, um, we're looking at you know basically around one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to to initially apply, uh, and then fees really range anywhere from five hundred thousand to two hundred to two point five million on the type A side uh, for the initial year, and then anywhere from say one hundred and twenty five thousand to six hundred twenty five uh thousand dollars each subsequent year of their five-year license so every year that someone's licensed the license is for five years they're going to be paying a different amount all of the amounts are based upon you know the status of the of the license whether or not they're a preferred applicant whether or not they're a professional organization a professional sports organization um, and the number of online partners that that type a proprietor has um, Similarly, on the type B side, but a little bit easier, um, twenty thousand to to apply, and then either fifty or a hundred thousand dollars for that first year, and then ten thousand each subsequent year again of that five year license. And the type C proprietor um, is looking at uh, fifteen thousand dollars to apply, and then a hundred thousand uh, dollars to get that license again for five years. Um, so those are the the proprietor side again. Those are those Ohio connections or the kiosk suppliers. And then when we get into the services providers, so the real sports book um, partners of these uh, businesses um, on the mobile management side, so the online app side, um, $150,000 to apply for the license, um, then anywhere um, from 187,000 all the way up to 3.3 million um, in subsequent year licensing. Um, and again, it just depends on the number of uh, partnerships that that uh, entity has. Um, and then again, the type B partners, the, the management services providers, $20,000 initially to apply, um, then either 50 or 100,000 thereafter um, for that first year, and then 10,000 uh, thereafter. Um, so again, resources are on our website. It's very complicated. It's very complex um, structure, but again, meets the General Assembly's, you know, uh, desire to encourage certain types of Ohio businesses to partner with different people. Uh, and so licensing fees um, are, are reflected there. And as a quick note, for those that are paying the licensing fees over more than just that initial year, there is also a bond requirement. Is that correct? That's right. That's in the statute. So anyone who gets that license then has to have that surety bond uh, to the state um, to ensure that we're going to receive the additional uh, uh, payments over time. Thank you very much. And uh, Michael uh, submitted a question and kind of beat me to the punch. If you have questions as we go through this, be sure to either type them into the, to the webinar chat in the Q&A feature. Um, as the questions are relevant to the topic that we're currently discussing, I'll throw them in. Um, if it's going to come up later in our outline, then I'll I'll save them until we get there. Uh, but but don't hesitate to type in questions as we go. Um, so with that, um, John, I'm going to kick back over to you for a minute before we start to loop carry in here. Um, you mentioned that there are certain throttles in place with the type C's that aren't there for the A's and B's. If you could take us through what that looks like and how you know really Kino was used sort of as a as a uh, archetype to to lay all this out for them. Sure. So, uh, yeah, there is uniqueness to type C that uh, is different than A and B. Uh, part of that, obviously, being the, the in-bar venue. 
what they've used is that liquor permit is basically an on-premise consumption liquor. So um, what it's kind of focused on for our retailer base, we have about 10,000 retailers throughout the state. Uh, the on-premise is about a quarter of that, uh, give or take, um, kind of focuses in on the bars and restaurants mostly. It does have some outliers, uh, things like grocery stores and that, that have your giant eagles that may have a market district and those type of places, but the vast majority of them are bars and restaurants. And so the way that it's formatted for us, uh, there are some limitations to some of the wagering and some of the um, vet types and things that are allowed for type C just to have it as more of a controlled environment. Um, part of that is uh, there's a $700 limit to your, your individual bet and also your weekly spend. There are um, more select wager types that are offered for type C uh, comparative to type A and type B. Uh, some of the more unique uh, as you start to see some of these very exotic uh, bet types through some of the other ones, those aren't really available for us through type C. So there are some limitations to that end. Um, for the most part though, uh, it has rolled relatively smoothly. There's still plenty that can be offered. It still is a product that um, does have a niche market, I think is, is something that uh, is unique to other states. There are other states that are doing retail options. I don't know if there's another state that has the uh, quantity of retail options that we will have uh, at January 1st, we launched over 750 bars and restaurants throughout the state. Um, I don't know of another state that has a retail uh, force like that. And it's something that's continuing to grow for us. Uh, as we mentioned, we've pre-approved over 1500 locations for a lottery recommendation. Over 1100 of those have applied for casino control license. So uh, while right now we're at about 775 locations, that is continuing to grow uh, each week, each month. Uh, we're starting to have more proprietors come on board. Uh, we currently have a, a balance of seven that have been licensed, six contracted, three are live currently, two more are, are really coming on in the next probably two to three weeks to get us up to five. And then those host locations, there is a gap of about 400, if you could tell from what we've pre-approved and what has been licensed. I think some of those, as we've gotten feedback, are just trying to see how this unfolds uh, it is a lot of moving parts and there is a lot of detail to it as far as finding a, a proprietor partner, signing a contract with them, trying to figure out what type of equipment you need in your location, what are your responsibilities. So I think as we roll out and some of them get to see kind of how this plays out, that number will continue to grow and uh, really the type C will kind of continue to blossom uh, throughout the state here. And two quick follow-ups, one from me and one from, uh, we do have an attendee that threw one in. And when we're talking about these proprietors and, and the hosts, this tends to be an extremely low margin uh, source of revenue for these, right? This is not a, a get rich uh, scheme for, for these bars and restaurants necessarily. For the most part, I, I think the way that it's structured, I think there is a mis, uh, misinformation from just when you see all the bets and all the, the handle and that throughout the country. Uh, what the actual margin is. I think it's typically uh, the hold is about five to 10% for what you're actually keeping as a book. So for the most part, when you see the all the sales, the majority of that is paid out back in prizes. So I think from our end of it, it is uh, a requirement for the proprietor to compensate them. So you all have, for the most part, a small percentage of revenue. But I think for the type C end of it, what they're also looking at is the foot traffic that comes with it. So the hope is as you come into the location, whether I may be making a commission off the, the revenue or not, you've stayed longer to watch the game and see if you're bet one, you've purchased more food, more drinks. And I think that is more of an ancillary is where they can see some of the benefit from this more so than a hard commission every week, every month from the prior. So I think that's kind of what they're looking at and we'll see how it plays out. Obviously, I think they're right in that sense that people are excited about sports betting and want to watch the games and be a part of it. So hopefully that is a benefit that they all will see. And then last quick question here. Um, it looks like, uh, uh, sorry, this is from an anonymous attendee, so I don't have a name for you. Um, to the extent you're able to speak to it, John, what was the rationale for tying the licenses to type C hosts uh, to the D1, D2, and D5 liquor licenses? So that is actually set forth in the legislation. So that was not a lottery uh, requirement. That is us just following what was put in place. I think the idea of it, again, was the on-premise, trying to focus on your bars and restaurants. 
Um, but that is something that is set forth for us in the bill, the D1, D2, D5. And we just, sorry, we just had another from uh, Joseph just sent in, uh, you mentioned earlier, nonprofits are not eligible to participate as hosts. Uh, so he just wanted to confirm that that is indeed what you said. Right. That is, again, part of part of the, the legislation that we have in place. So what we've done is, is honestly follow uh, what is in place. If you have the D1, D2, D5, we have seen some unique locations that uh, I think surprise us all that had the requirements. There's a few unique gas stations and unique uh, locations throughout the state. And as long as they met the basic requirements, uh, we've allowed them to move forward. So we haven't added any arbitrary other than you being an active and good standing lottery retailer. Everything else is really uh, set forth for us in the bill. I'm pretty sure most of those were sent by my client. So, <laughs> <laughs> no comment um, on that. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, before we now kick it over and get Carrie involved here, um, Andromeda, going back to you. So in terms of media coverage around the launch, there has been considerable coverage of the recent violations of the responsible gaming and gambling regulations. Um, and in particular, uh, Caesars, BetMGM, and DraftKings, as well as the Penn Gaming Barstool fine um, in the aggregate totaling a little over a million dollars, I think about 1.3 million. Um, so if you could take us through the authority to sanction and sort of what that enforcement process looks like and why um, Governor DeWine has given this sort of directive to, to really ensure that RG is being taken seriously in the state of Ohio. Yeah, happy to. Um, so the commission has, just like uh, with our other uh, regulated uh, entities um, on the casino gaming side, on, on the fantasy contest side, um, skill games, um, we have pretty broad uh, statutory grant of authority to ensure the integrity of all these gaming products. Um, and part of that comes with the ability to not only establish, you know, the, the regulations, uh, that we have uh, based off of the statute, but also to enforce those through administrative action. So um, it can come in the form of action on licensing, whether it's denial or revocation or suspension of licensing, um, or in the cases that you've mentioned here, uh, the issuance of um, administrative sanctions um, and monetary amounts. Um, and the whole purpose of this is to um, ensure compliance and obtain compliance from, from the operators and the industry as a whole. Uh, to to follow Ohio law. Um, and so, you know, Ohio is not unique in the sense that we require responsible gaming messages. Um, we require um, a conspicuous display of a responsible gaming hotline number, such as the, the net problem gambling uh, number that you mentioned earlier or 1-800-GAMBLER. Um, but we also have specific requirements to not advertise on college campuses or target uh, college campuses, obviously not targeting individuals under 21 uh, and not using the words free or risk free uh, in promotions if a player actually has to risk or spend uh, their own funds uh, to do so. So um, very specific uh, responsible gaming and, and consumer fairness uh, regulations and unfortunately uh, right at the start, we saw uh, some advertisements that violated uh, these requirements. Uh, in some cases, we had advertising on, on a college campus. Uh, in some cases, we had uh, directed uh, mailers to individuals who were under the age of 21. Uh, and in some cases, we had more general advertisements that didn't contain that conspicuous responsible gaming message, or, or in some cases, didn't have a responsible gaming message at all. Uh, or they use that that free or risk free, but they required a patron to spend money. You know, a uh, bet five get twenty free um, it would violate that promotional requirement. And so uh, we have issued five sanctions. Um, we did some right before launch, and then some uh, on January fifth um, uh, regarding uh, these violations. And they're all working through um, the administrative hearing process, the administrative uh, procedure process. Uh, just like every other state, we have to provide notice, opportunity for hearing. Um, oftentimes, we're able to work through things um, through through settling uh, these outside of the hearing, and so those are in different stages. But at the last commission meeting on the 18th, we did resolve uh, the the violation regarding Caesars, uh, so that actually has been resolved on that $150,000 penalty for 
uh, again, using the words free or risk-free um, and not containing responsible gaming messages. Um, and I really think um, this is something that we want the industry to know and be aware of, that the commission takes responsible gambling seriously um, and that we are going to be uh, wanting to ensure that that operators are following all aspects of Ohio law, but that this is a, a base consumer protection that that needs to be in place um, and, and people need to be very mindful of it. Um, but that said, you know, we have seen a great improvement from the industry after we've issued these sanctions. Um, we've had great interaction with the industry coming to ensure before they're launching advertisements that they're in compliance. And so um, that is really what we're after. We are not a sanction heavy commission. Um, it's not something that we take lightly, um, but it is designed to, to get the industry to, to conform and adhere to Ohio's requirements. Thank you very much. All right. And now to get uh, Carrie from our hometown cabs involved here. Thank you for your patience, Carrie. Uh, so we're going to start off with um, which licenses have the Cleveland Cavaliers filed for. I believe that that train might have already been pretty far in motion by the time you came on as the HEC. Um, but if you could take us through what licenses were applied for, what was the differences, and then to the extent that you can generally talk about it, that experience and, and process, what was that like with Ohio Casino Control? Thanks, Ricky, and thanks to the CMBA for having me. Um, you know, as Andromeda mentioned, there are partnerships sort of baked into these type A and type B licenses, which are the ones that the Cavaliers hold. So the type A, again, is the you know, computer website, the mobile application, and then type B is our brick and mortar uh, retail location right here in Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse. And so we applied for both type A and type B. Um, as Andromeda mentioned, you know, sports teams were given preference in issuing those licenses. You know, we put the, the sports and sports betting. And so we certainly wanted to take advantage of that opportunity and really unlock all of those options. So we did proceed with both type A and type B. And in doing that, you know, we really wanted to make sure that we were performing our due diligence on our partners and looking for those that have alignment with our mission, vision, values, and also with our you know, business goals. And in that, you know, we found an incredible partner in Caesars. Um, they have experience right in building sports books within NBA venues. Um, they were actually the first organization to build a sports book in a professional sports venue in May 2021 with the Washington Wizards at Capital One Arena. Um, and so certainly that was something that we were incredibly interested in working with this partner that had a reputation of, of excellence and this legacy of being able to really get this up and running at a high level. And so, you know, those are the two avenues that we went down and ultimately ended up connecting with Caesars because of our, our shared alignment on what we wanted the sports book to be. Ultimately, you know, it's a venue in the heart of downtown Cleveland, right, that provides unique connectivity for our fans and engagement, both on, you know, Cavs games, Monsters games, non-event days. You know, we have over 200 ticketed events here at Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse every year. Um, the sports book is open even on non-event days, which I happen to love because I'll pop down to the full service restaurant and, and get a, you know, great lunch and pop back on up to work. And so we really enjoyed having the sports book up and running here. Um, and so we, we look forward to what's going to happen next. And in terms of your experience and process, I mean, again, I, I believe uh, I'm trying to remember exactly when you came on with the Cavs, but, um, you know, about how long did that process take, especially when given the requirements for all of your majority owners of the entity that's applying have to provide a considerable amount of financial disclosures and things like that when you have a Dan Gilbert, uh, who clearly owns a lot of things. Um, you know, so it feels like there was probably um, quite a process that you guys had to go through in terms of providing all of the information on the front end of that licensing process. Absolutely. And, and certainly, you know, we've been involved in this process since before, um, you know, it, it came to pass through the General Assembly. We were involved in lobbying efforts to bring sports betting to Ohio and sort of from that through, you know, launch on January 1st, 2023, it's been, you know, an everyday endeavor and certainly want to, you know, thank our friends at the OCCC for really helping us along the way. Um, this was quite an administrative heavy lift. I mean, to your point, there are numerous disclosures that need to be made regarding ownership, regarding, you know, our partnership with Caesars 
And that's something that we would have to really rely heavily on the OCCC um, and working with them on almost a day to day basis to walk us through, you know, questions that we had and, and you know, the timeliness and resources that they provided were incredible. So, I mean, this has been years in the making and certainly, you know, a, a dedicated team effort with everybody leaning in on it. And so, um, you know, it wouldn't be out of the ordinary for, you know, a week to go by and we're working on nothing else, but, you know, getting us in a position to be ready for, for launch day on Jan 1. And so certainly, you know, that's something that had an extraordinary, extraordinarily long amount of lead time to it, both on the licensing side and on the sponsorship side. Yes, I, I don't know that I'll ever be able to truly tell you exactly what happened in the months of June, July, and August of 2022, based on all of the administrative uh, things that were going on on this front. Um, so your 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 agreement with Caesars, and, and maybe not to specifically talk about that one, but to more broadly talk about the partnerships that are being done between NDA teams and these betting companies in states and jurisdictions that obviously allow it, are those sponsorships contingent on the partner actually obtaining their license? Sure, Ricky. So it's twofold. Um, for our specifically gaming partners, like Caesars, for example, yes, we would want them to be fully licensed in order to you know, activate on those sponsorship elements because they are you know, here in our building. But on the flip side of that, we've got partners such as Betway, who are, are pre featured pretty prominently in our signage and around um, the baseline of the court. Those folks have to be authorized gaming operators, but they don't necessarily need to be our partners with respect to our type A or our type B license. But we certainly need to be partnering in terms of advertising, signage, um, any sort of sponsorship elements. Those do need to be with folks who are fully authorized within the state of Ohio in order to move forward with that. But they don't necessarily need to be our type A or type B partner. Thank you. And shifting over to the NBA perspective and uh, whatnot. So for example, for the, the sake of our audience, like Major League Baseball does not permit a brick and mortar sports betting partner within the confines of the stadium. Now, obviously, baseball has a much more complex relationship with sports betting and the sports betting industry than some of the other leagues have. Um, but what's the perspective that the NBA has taken in their approach with regards to sports betting? And, and what are you guys really allowed to do from a league perspective when it comes to the brick and mortars component of your partnership? Yeah, that's a great question, Ricky. And, and certainly we're uniquely positioned. You mentioned, you know, the MLB rules, the NFL, for example, would allow uh, an in-venue sports book, but not active on game day. And so we're sort of, um, you know, in a position where we can have a retail sports book within our venue and have that retail sports book be operational on our game days. And so, you know, the NBA and the Cavaliers are sort of really committed to having a unique and engaging fan experience. And we think that we accomplish that through having this, you know, connectivity and robust opportunity to engage with fans. That said, the integrity of our game, of our league, of our team is our highest priority. And so to safeguard that, we've taken, um, you know, the NBA gaming policy, the Rocket Mortgage gaming policy, and the OCCC rules and really instill those into our team members. So for example, you know, as a team member of the Cleveland Cavaliers, I am not permitted to bet on any NBA game or event, whether that's a Cavs game, whether that's a Warriors game, whether that's Donovan Mitchell for 71 points, you name it, I'm not allowed to bet on it. And that holds true for the NBA, the WNBA, the NBA G League, any sort of um, game or event within the ambit of that universe. Um, from the OCCC perspective and from Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse perspective, um, as team members, we're not permitted to bet on any game or sport or event at all, regardless of whether it's NBA, MLB, NHL, in the Caesars that's on site. So certainly, you know, I could place a bet on the Guardians via the Caesars mobile app um, from my home, but I wouldn't be permitted to do that within the Caesar Sportsbook in our facility. And so we try to put these guardrails in place and really make sure that our team members are very familiar with them and understand that this is a zero tolerance issue um, to make sure that we are safeguarding the integrity of our sport. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, we did have an earlier question from the audience uh, with regards to prop bets on player performances. Um, so uh, I think I'll start here, Carrie, and then I'll let you add anything you'd like. Um, so the, the entirety of the question was, has any players union like the NBPA ever asserted a right for the union to be compensated 
because these betting options touch upon players' rights of publicity. Uh, so, Michael, I would probably first point you to a case that was CBC Distribution and Marketing versus uh, MLB's BAM, uh, the Advanced Media, uh, which basically says that uh, statistics and public information of players uh, is is available for use by companies when it comes to. In that case, it was fantasy bets, uh, fantasy sports. I would I would guess that it's not a, a big leap and a jump uh, for sports betting to also get wrapped up into that. Uh, but Carrie, I don't know if there's anything you want to add in terms of uh, a player's union asserting rights to any of the revenues derived from this. Yeah, I think there's a unique intersection here, to be sure, between sports betting and player rights of publicity. And, you know, to your, your earlier citation, you're exactly right. You know, we, we would take the position that, you know, that's sort of outside the ambit of rights of publicity. But that said, there are serious, you know, crossover here. So, for example, we've got Jamie Foxx and Kevin Hart as spokes persons for, you know, these operators. They're not using professional athletes, and that's by design, right? Um, we want to make sure that there's, again, no, no issues with integrity in the leagues, but also in terms of, you know, rights of publicity, we are very mindful of the advertising landscape, right, and not using players in terms of, you know, plastering their name image likeness around those underlying bets, right? Listing Donovan Mitchell to go off for 71 points is very different than, you know, showing him with, you know, the bottle of water dumped on his head, you know, can he do it again sort of thing. Um, so it's all sort of a matter of degree, I would say. And I would expect, Michael, um, this to be a topic of conversation as we head into the collective bargaining um, renewal period. And certainly we'll, we'll keep an eye on that one. Thank you very much. And last question for you, Carrie, before we uh, open it back up to initial impressions and our perspective outlook to the entire panel. Um, so, Carrie, what are the responsibilities of the Cavs from an actual sports betting perspective, if any? Are you guys just providing the space, or is there more involvement than that for the Cavs as far as the actual operation of the sports book goes? So, Caesars is the one who would be, you know, accepting bets, placing bets, cashing out bets, and so. Our responsibility is primarily on the fan experience side, you know, making sure that there is a safe and clean environment in Caesar Sportsbook, but less so in terms of the management of, you know, the lines or odds or accepting bets or anything like that. Great. All right. Now opening it back up uh, to the overall panel here. Um, so we're now 26 days, which seems like about five years into the initial launch of sports betting in Ohio. Um, and, and we already had a record set in the state of Ohio. So just kind of taking it through and we'll start with Andromeda, then go to John and Carrie, um, what have been your initial impressions of this rollout, um, you know, as, as sports betting has come to Ohio? Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, from our perspective, it has been uh, a pretty smooth rollout. Um, there was a lot of work that was put in, uh, not only from, from the commission, from the lottery commission, uh, but also all of the operators, all of the, the people who are involved uh, in this industry uh, from the private business side to make the launch successful. Um, and I think you saw that that come through. Um, so there has been articles, there has been a geolocation uh, firm that has released that Ohio, you know, on opening weekend, you know, had more people logging in uh, for sports wagering online than any other state or jurisdiction that currently exists. Um, or, or has. And so obviously, uh, you know, those numbers are, are really interesting. One thing that I will let you know is I don't have any specific numbers uh, yet in terms of revenue or anything like that. Um, the way that that works is um, the operators have to report monthly. So um, their uh, tax return for the month of January won't be due until um, mid-February, February 15th. Um, and then the Casino Control Commission, just as we do for the casinos and we post revenue on our on our website on a monthly basis, we'll post sports gaming revenue, um, but it will be at the end of each month for the previous month. So January's data will be available at the very end of February. Um, and that will be uh, kind of the ongoing the ongoing basis. Um, I do know um, that someone in the in the chat did ask, you know, what what were the estimated revenue figures? Again, the commission didn't do any estimated right revenue figures, but the Legislative Services Commission, um, which supports the General Assembly as they were drafting this, did come up with um, what they believe the market will hold 
Um, and so uh, it's expected that sports gaming in Ohio is going to be about a $3.35 billion per year industry um, once it reaches maturity in a couple of years. And so I think everyone will be interested to see how that plays out and if those uh, those estimates hold true or not. Um, but that was the the estimates that that were uh, prepared for the General Assembly as they were creating the, the legislation. And before we jump to John, because I do have a Q&A that I think maybe only I can see and not the entire panel here, um, the revenue earmarked uh, that's going to be generated by this by the state. So first, uh, Andrew, I'm going to correct me if I'm wrong, but the state of Ohio has a 10% state tax on this revenue. Uh, Correct. Which just real quick for the audience, it's pretty low relative to the other states and jurisdictions around the country. Um, but to the extent you're able to speak to it, what is that revenue earmarked for uh, by the legislation in the state of Ohio? Yeah, happy to. Um, so uh, a significant portion of the revenue goes to support educational efforts. Um, uh, there's also a, a percentage that goes to support uh, problem gambling services. So that would be, you know, treatment professionals as well as uh, prevention, outreach, and awareness uh, efforts on the state level. Um, and uh, then a small percentage, uh, I think half of a percent or thereabouts, um, also goes to support veteran services. So um, that's um, on the, the, the tax side, as well as many of the license fees um, that were established by statute. So um, uh, that is where those, those revenues go. And the General Assembly earmarked those for specific, you know, legislative priorities. Um, uh, to support, you know, kind of uh, those programs that they have. Thank you very much, Andrew. I'm going to next up, uh, John, what have been your initial impressions since January 1st? Thank you. Well, I would echo a lot of what Andromeda said. Um, I think it's been a, a great deal of work from all ends, from ourselves. I know Casino Control has been an awesome partner for us and helping with rules as early on in the beginning of the process, but also a lot of collaboration back and forth because of the uniqueness of our relationship with the way it's set up. Um, and I also know from the vendor end, sportsbook wise and the proprietors, uh, the sheer amount of work that has been put in from them and the requirements that we've asked for them, uh, they have done an excellent job as well too. So to me, I think it's been a great success for the type C end of it. When you consider uh, we launched again, over 750 locations throughout the state that is coordinating with these proprietor partners that's setting up their own networks and installing equipment and building up this infrastructure from a year ago where there was nothing for a lot of these proprietors. So I think it's been an amazing lift. And I think going forward, it's continuing to grow from our end. Um, part of the type C again is, is there's the ability to source these kiosks and build up your revenue and build up your uh, inventory of, of equipment to get out these locations as you're making partnerships. So I think it's just going to continue to grow as the proprietors get more comfortable in the space, start to build up their own infrastructure and build their inventory and be able to kind of develop those kiosks in, in all different avenues and start to use some of the uniqueness that they have to create that niche for type C. Obviously, type A is, is always going to be the largest cut of, of sports betting in any state that you look at. So I think finding what that target market is for type C and who will be involved in that and what that kind of looks like will start to make itself clear as we go. Um, and I would just say, I looked at the chat, and I just wanna make sure I was clear. Um, for the Type C host, you must be a for-profit organization. So you cannot be a nonprofit. I'm not sure if I swapped that when I said it out loud, but- uh, no, I believe you said that correctly. That. <laughs> yes, okay. And then I would say for our end, for Type C, our revenue that we're creating, um, I know for Andromeda mentioned Type A and Type B, it's said in the legislation for Type C, we were able to um, set that ourselves. Ours goes to the Lottery Profit Education Fund, just like our traditional lottery um, revenue goes as well. So it's all gonna be filtered in the same area that our current lottery revenue goes as well. Awesome, thanks, John. All right, Carrie, uh, initial impressions since launch. I think we've started off really strong since January 1st, um, and we're only continuing to build momentum as more and more folks come into the field house and, you know, have a drink place event at Caesar Sportsbook. We are getting tremendous feedback um, and how folks really think it's, you know, elevated their experience. And I do think that, you know, we will continue to work on public education in terms of sports betting. Uh, we'll look to have sports betting theme nights. And so I think that there's a lot of areas for opportunity and growth in this space. Thank you very much. 
All right, Carrie. Um, okay, so we've had a few questions come in now that I do want to do want to touch on. So um, we've had a couple variations of this question, um, but uh, uh, how effective? Uh, and I would say this is probably directed to Andromeda and and John, though uh, it's not specified. How effective have has Ohio's problem gambling warnings hotlines been to prevent increases in gambling addictions issues in Ohio? Um, and then you kind of already touched on this, but does Ohio have an intention to fund treatment for gambling addiction? I can I can start and John, you can also come in uh, on the lottery side as well. Yes, the state um, absolutely does uh, fund uh, problem gambling, not only prevention and treatment uh, options. Uh, we have been doing so uh, since uh, casino gaming uh, launched, you know, over a decade ago. Um, so those uh, those programs are not new, but they have been expanded um, and improved upon uh, with the advent of sports wagering. Uh, and the one that um, most comes to mind is uh, a voluntary exclusion process. So, um, you know, with the casinos and the racinos, um, the Casino Control Commission and the lottery uh, cooperated on a joint program uh, to allow patrons to what's called self-exclude, which means that if they're experiencing struggle and they think that they need to have um, an additional check and, and be prevented from going into to a gaming facility, that they can sign up for a period of time uh, with the state and uh, that they uh, then would have, uh, you know, basically checks in place uh, to try to exclude them from, from those gaming facilities. Um, the process used to be uh, kind of an in-person um, uh, process, and so with the advent of sports wagering, um, that program has been expanded to include sports wagering both online and in person, um, and uh, also the ability to, to sign up for that program has also been uh, expanded to an online portal, so uh, you no longer need to, to meet face-or-face -face with a, a casino or a lottery personnel. Uh, you now have the option to to engage uh, with the state through an online website to to sign up. Um, uh, those tend to be very effective um, in terms of giving people just additional self help tools um, to uh, manage, you know, what struggle they're having uh, at that particular juncture. Um, so, uh, if anyone is interested, that's the Time Out Ohio website that Ricky had mentioned, um, and there are a bunch of other uh, programs out there uh, that we do. Uh, uh, both in conjunction with Lottery and um, OMAS. Uh, there are community uh, toolkits that are available where different uh, community organizations, different local governments can take them, bring them as their own uh, and be able to get resources out there as well as uh, obviously funding the Ohio Helpline, uh, which is staffed as uh, well as a warm transfer program where if you're calling into that helpline, you can get connected to a treatment professional uh, kind of live that day um, to to improve uh, the experience and get people the help that they need. Um, and so again, funding for uh, for responsible gaming is part of the General Assembly's uh, intention uh, for revenue that's being received um, from from not only the licensing fees, but also from, uh, you know, all of the different revenue sources that sports gaming is going to be bringing into the state, um, whatever those numbers end up responsible gaming is part of that equation and will continue to be part of that equation. And if I could just add, Andromeda hit it right on the head. I, I think the VEP expansion is something that we worked with Casino Control on and, and the ability to have that uh, no online portal as a way, like they say, you're able to play place a wager on your phone at home. Now you're able to exclude yourself uh, in the privacy of your home as well if, if you don't want to go into a casino or a casino to do that. So that expansion, I know from the lotteries and as well, it's it's taken uh, responsible gaming incredibly serious, uh, like we have for traditional lottery as well. Uh, I know for our end with the proprietors, they all were required to provide a responsible gaming plan uh, that's updated annually. All of that advertising and marketing will include usually your your either your problem gambling line, uh, either the Ohio line or the national line. It also includes the website. So just trying to make clear, twenty one and over for play. Those resources are available. We will have handouts and things in these host locations that we do now already. But I know the proprietors will have materials they'll be passing out. The lottery in conjunction will be assisting with that as well with different types of pamphlets and coasters and other kind of things that just make clear that, that there is help out there if you need it and how to get that in a way that is a, a safe and easily accessible 
uh, process. Yeah, and, and I'll also just add there are some contingencies on the back end as well, at least with regards to proprietors, where as we are redeeming winning tickets there for certain thresholds, there is a check against the VEP portal most recent list, which the proprietors are required to access and download on a weekly basis to ensure that members of that VEP list aren't, because uh, there is an anonymization component to betting in the kiosks on site of the, the hosts. Um, so there are still some, again, some last ditch efforts to, to maintain that RG um, component to all of this. Uh, all right, so we only have a couple more minutes here. Uh, we, Linda, we got a couple questions from her. I would say the first one, how does Ohio's differ from other states? We've kind of touched on throughout the entirety of this panel. I will just add that not every state has two state agencies involved administering things. Uh, Ohio is not the only state that that's like. Uh, but but it is, uh, I would say, probably in the minority of states um, that, that does that. And then um, it was reported recently, and I believe this was covered at the most recent OCCC hearing last week, that um, University of Dayton basketball players were threatened by losing gamblers. Are there realistic enforcement mechanisms in place to address these kinds of situations going forward? I think Andromeda, that's probably for you. <laughs> that one's for me. Um, so in addition, obviously threatening people is a violation of, of Ohio law. Uh, there's criminal statutes that, that are in place. And so obviously players that are receiving threatening messages are being threatened by individuals always have and should continue to, to go through that route. Um, and, you know, it's something that we've become aware of and we're, our executive director did make statements at our most recent public meeting that we would explore whether or not involuntary exclusion. So we have the voluntary exclusion process. The involuntary exclusion process is where the commission is placing someone on a ban list, essentially, uh, whether or not that might be an option uh, there. But uh, our hope is that the already existing you know, criminal process uh, works uh, and is able to be utilized by these uh, players if they are receiving those messages. But we are looking at whether or not there's there's additional remedies that might be available. Of course, we don't regulate the individual betters; we regulate the entities. And so, um, trying to to uh, look at what the realistic regulatory functions are uh, when it comes to individualized behavior is a very different analysis compared to looking at the regulatory function of a regulated business entity. All right, thank you very much, Andromeda. So it uh, looks like we do not have any more audience questions. So with that, I do want to take the chance to again thank Dominica, and I didn't mention Carrie Burns at the beginning, but Carrie as well, and the CMBA as, as an entirety. John, Carrie, Andromeda, you guys were awesome. Thank you all very much for, for joining today. Um, and so with that, I think we're going to conclude this discussion on the first month of sports betting in Ohio. Awesome job. Thank you, everyone, for your time. John, Andromeda, Carrie, Ricky, excellent program. You guys wrapped up right on time. Everyone, I'm sure, appreciates that. Um, so with that, we will conclude. I'll email the CLE survey to everyone, and we'll see you next time. Um, hope to continue these discussions, and everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you.